The Pig War in 1859 is one of the most obscure and unusual events in Britain's long and colourful history. In a tense standoff, over 400 US soldiers faced five Royal Navy warships on a tiny island between Vancouver and Seattle. In this forgotten moment, the United Kingdom and the United States almost went to war again, and all because of a dead pig. This is the story of the Pig War of 1859. The roots of the war lay in a tiny detail from a treaty between the two nations, written over ten years beforehand. Throughout the early 19th century, the British and the Americans had both laid claim to the area between the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Coast, in what is now the US states of Oregon and Washington and the Canadian province of British Columbia. Eventually, in the Oregon Treaty of 1846, the two nations agreed to set the border at the 49th parallel of North Latitude, all the way from the mountains to the sea. It remains the border to this day. It was also agreed that the British would gain possession of the whole of Vancouver Island, off the mainland. So far so good. However, there was one tiny loose end in the treaty. As Vancouver Island actually went south of the 49th parallel line that had been used on the mainland, exactly where was the maritime boundary between the British and the Americans? The treaty had said that the border would be the middle of the channel separating the continent from Vancouver Island. <laughs> but life's never simple, is it? Because in the middle of that body of water lay a small group of islands. So there wasn't a single channel, there were actually several, but two in particular. The Americans claimed that the channel was the Harrow Strait between the island of San Juan and Vancouver Island, strategically very close to the British town of Victoria on the southern tip of the main island. Not surprisingly, the British were not keen on that option. They preferred the American border well away from the maritime activities of Victoria and to have a wider British-controlled waterway up to Vancouver. They argued that the Rosario Strait further to the east was the border, which incidentally would give them control of those islands. And the key island in this argument was the one closest to Vancouver Island, San Juan, just seven miles across the water from Victoria. In 1853, the USA formally claimed San Juan, but apart from their declaration, which the British just ignored, they did nothing about it. The problem was, apart from doing nothing to implement their claim, there was already a British settlement on the island. Just two years beforehand, the Hudson Bay Company had established a salmon curing station on the western shore facing Vancouver Island. And now, in that very same year that the US were making a formal claim, the Hudson Bay Company established a sheep ranch at Bellevue Sheep Farm on the southern shore. It seems that the British were following that old maxim that possession is nine-tenths of the law. In 1856, ten years after the Oregon Treaty, the two sides set up a boundary commission to settle this outstanding tiny issue, but they couldn't reach an agreement. The British claimed San Juan and pointed out that they had commercial interests and citizens settled on the island, whereas the Americans did not. Well, there's always an easy way to counter that. 29 American settlers swiftly arrived. Let's be honest, San Juan is a small island, but it is big enough for the two bands of settlers, and by all accounts the two communities got on quite well. But all that changed on the 15th of June, 1859. American settler Lyman Cutler looked out of his window and saw a pig digging up his crop of potatoes. The pig belonged to a Hudson Bay employee, Charles Griffin. Now, supposedly Griffin owned several pigs that roamed freely across the island, and it seems that this was not the first time that Farmer Cutler had had his potatoes dug up by the hungry porker. Incensed, Cutler grabbed his rifle and shot the pig. Mr Griffin wasn't best pleased when he found out what had happened and paid the farmer a visit. In a heated exchange, Lyman Cutler announced that he had shot the pig because it was eating my potatoes. Griffin angrily responded, it's up to you to keep your potatoes out of my pig. <laughs> Neighbour disputes, they never change, do they? An apologetic cutler offered £10 in compensation, but Griffin turned his offer down, demanding £100 instead. When cutler refused, Griffin stormed off, probably muttering something about you'll hear from my lawyers. And I say that only slightly in jest. He now appealed to the British authorities over on Vancouver Island to arrest cutler and throw out the Americans who were, as he saw it, trespassing on British land. This neighbour dispute was getting heated, and it now moved up another notch. 
One of the American settlers, Paul Hobbs, had served in the US Army during the war with Mexico back in the 1840s. And he happened to know an old officer from that campaign who was now stationed in nearby Oregon by the name of Captain George Pickett. And if that name rings a bell, yes, George Pickett was at Gettysburg a few years later. Hubs appealed to Pickett, who went to his commanding officer, Brigadier General William Harney. Aged 59, Harney was a veteran of the Mexican War and had earned a reputation as an Indian fighter when also participating in the First Sioux War. He was now commanding the US Army in the Department of Oregon, in which the island of San Juan technically sat. No friend of the British, he saw the territorial integrity of the USA under threat and immediately dispatched Captain Pickett and 64 men of D Company from the 9th US Infantry to the island to prevent any British evictions. This was a classic example of that old phrase, making a mountain out of a molehill. Because in the 1850s, this was pretty small fry. Britain had only three years beforehand come out of the Crimean War, and that was swiftly followed by the Sepoy Revolt. And the USA had her own bigger problems too. Tensions between the northern and southern states over slavery were starting to slide dangerously towards conflict. And that last point provides us with an interesting possibility. George McClellan, a fellow West Point student and friend of Pickett's, claimed that Harney and Pickett had basically conspired to create a war with Britain to unify those two factions in the USA against a common enemy. An alternative theory put forward by another military leader, General O'Halla, suggested that it was an attempt by Virginian George Pickett to divert the North's attention whilst the Southern states seceded from the Union. Both are intriguing and plausible. Let's face it, it wouldn't be the first time a war has been started to deflect domestic attention, and it certainly wouldn't be the last either. Word now reached the governor of the British colony on Vancouver Island, James Douglas, that US troops had landed on San Juan, and he ordered a British frigate, HMS Tribune, to sail across the narrow strait from Victoria to confront them. Carrying 31 guns, HMS Tribune was a clear sign that the British were not backing down. Rather than being cowed by the 31 guns of the Royal Navy, Pickett lined his 64 men up on the beach in fighting formation and announced that he would make a Bunker Hill of it, a reference to the battle during the American Revolution, when whilst losing, the Americans had inflicted enormous casualties on the British. Whether Pickett was a rash glory seeker, or whether he was deliberately goading the British into a war, is open to question. Fortunately, the captain of HMS Tribune was not so gung-ho. Despite just being in his 30s, like Pickett, Captain Geoffrey Hornby had already served in the Royal Navy for 22 years. <laughs> and if you're trying to do the maths, yes, he really did join when he was 12. With his 31 guns aimed menacingly at Pickett's 64 infantry formed up on the shore, who was in the stronger position? He was happy to let the Americans march up and down on that beach for as long as they liked. Hornby's restrained approach wasn't what Governor Douglas had expected. He sent two more naval vessels across the San Juan, HMS Satellite and HMS Plumper. The latter had been serving in the West Africa squadron, tackling the slave trade prior to being moved to the Pacific. Hornby would actually end up commanding the West Africa squadron a few years later, on his way to becoming an admiral of the fleet. Douglas now ordered Hornby to put his Royal Marines ashore and eject all of the Americans on the island, including Pickett's infantry. Hornby diplomatically refused to act, stating he'd only do so when the commander of the Royal Navy's Pacific Station, Rear Admiral Robert Baines, ordered him to do so. Baines was a veteran of the Royal Navy. Born in 1796, he'd entered the service in 1810 when he was 14. He'd seen action in the Napoleonic Wars, and in the War of 1812 with the Americans. In the 1820s, he'd fought at the Battle of Navarino, a decisive naval engagement during the Greek War of Independence when a combined British, French and Russian fleet had defeated the Ottomans. More recently, he'd commanded ships in both the Black Sea and the Baltic during the Crimean War. In 1857, he'd been appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Station. So, not a man who feared a fight, and a man who'd fought the Americans before. All eyes turned to Baines. Admiral Baines arrived off San Juan on board the 84-gun HMS Ganges. 
Ganges was the fifth Royal Naval ship now lying off the tiny island. He was incredulous with what he saw. During the past weeks, the Americans had been reinforcing Pickett's garrison, cranking that war notch up even more. There were now 461 US troops with a 22 cannon in a well-constructed redoubt on the island. Facing them were five Royal Navy ships, 2,000 men and over 100 guns. What on earth was going on? He sailed over to Victoria to liaise with the governor. James Douglas urged him to use his military advantage to force the Americans to back down. Baines was no fool. How could the US forces be ejected from territory that they rightly believed was theirs without shots being fired? And when that happened, where would it end? He point blank refused to launch a war, as he said, between great nations over a squabble about a pig. By now, word had reached Washington DC about this developing crisis. President James Buchanan was as horrified as Admiral Baines about the situation, not least because he could ill afford a war with Britain while secession was hanging over the United States. Rapidly, he dispatched an emissary, General Winfield Scott, like Baines, a veteran of the War of 1812, to negotiate with Governor Douglas. Whilst the 73-year-old Scott took the long journey to the Oregon, British Columbia region, by ship to the Caribbean, crossing Panama, and then taking another ship up the Pacific coast, the two sides at San Juan Island continued their standoff. Whilst a flare-up was never far away, this potential war was also slightly bizarre. From time to time, the Royal Navy would carry out gunnery practices, bombarding the cliffs well away from the American troops. This became so regular that civilians from Victoria would sail over to enjoy the spectacle. Even more bizarre, considering that at any moment war could break out, was the fact that the American officers would row out to HMS Satellite and join their British counterparts for church services on Sundays. Eventually, in October 1859, Scott arrived on the scene. In the ensuing negotiations, they still couldn't agree over who owned the island, but it was agreed that ownership of the 55 square mile island really wasn't worth, as Admiral Baines had said, a war between two great nations over a pig. Both sides agreed to stand down, and it was further agreed that each country would station a token force of 100 men on the island. The Americans established a camp on the south end of the island. 100 Royal Marines were landed and established English camp at Garrison Bay. And so ended the near miss of the Pig War between the USA and the United Kingdom. The two garrisons would remain on the island for over a decade, and rather like the settlers, seemed to get on, participating in athletics matches, celebrating holidays, and even the odd drink. During that time, Vancouver Island joined the Dominion of Canada, and the USA did indeed descend into civil war. It was a civil war that would see George Pickett, now a general, lead the Confederate charge against Cemetery Ridge during the Battle of Gettysburg. The disastrous and bloody charge is often seen as the high watermark of the Confederacy, and has gone down in history as Pickett's charge. After the war, Pickett, fearing prosecution for allegedly shooting Union prisoners, fled the country. Ironically, he fled to, of all places based upon this story, Canada. The ownership of San Juan Island was finally determined by international arbitration under Kaiser Wilhelm I of Germany. In 1872, he ruled that the border ran down the Harrow Strait and that therefore San Juan belonged to the USA. In November that same year, the last contingent of Royal Marines left English camp and 18 months later, the American troops had gone too. So the Americans ended up with the islands. But the British can gain some satisfaction that the Union flag is flown every day at English camp. It must be one of the very few non-diplomatic sites in the USA when government employees host a foreign nation's flag on their soil. And so ended the Pig War, a flashpoint where 400 troops faced off five British warships and a real shooting war was a very strong possibility. Fortunately, cool heads like Admiral Bailey and Captain Hornby prevented a clash that could rapidly have got out of hand. And at the end of the day, this war only had one casualty, the pig. Thanks for joining me today, and I hope you enjoyed that little known story about the pig war of 1859. I have some other videos about the British in North America on my channel, including the War of 1812 and General Sir Garnet Walsley's Red River Expedition in Canada. Check them out. And if you're enjoying my channel, then please join my supporters club. Click the link in the description to find out more.
Lots more stories coming up, including the equally bizarre named War of Jenkins' Ear. But in the meantime, thanks for your support, keep well, and I'll see you very soon.